So our next presentation will be Clinton Work from TELUS, uh, talking a little bit about their experience in deploying IPv6 on their network, lessons learned, and how we got there. So welcome, Clinton. Hi, uh, so for people that don't know me, I'm uh, Clinton Work with the uh, TELUS uh, Network Operations Team. Um, <clears throat> Matthew Wilder from our tech strategy team actually put this uh, presentation together and uh, submitted it to Nanog. Unfortunately, he couldn't be here, so I've uh, taken over the presentation on his behalf, but uh, I've been involved with our uh, IPv6 program for the past couple of years. Uh, so what am I going to talk today about? Uh, a few key questions about that we had to decide about our IPv6 deployment at TELUS. Uh, what did we learn from our deployment and we can share with other people? Uh, how did we do our IPv6 uh, address planning? Uh, what are some of the big picture realities about deploying v6 for other ISPs and TELUS as well? Um, and then now we get to sit back uh, after all of our hard work and, and watch uh, V6 scale on our network. And then finally, we'll see if you guys have any questions. Uh, the key questions uh, that we answered about uh, or we considered about our V6 deployment when we started almost three years ago, uh, why, why deploy V6? Uh, who needs to be involved in a V6 deployment plan? Uh, what solutions will you employ to uh, get v6 out there? Uh, where will you deploy v6 in your network? Uh, you may have multiple networks like we do. You know, you have uh, consumer customers, business customers, as well as wireless. Uh, when will you do deploy v6 to your customers? And finally, uh, how do you make sure that uh, you can scale your deployment uh, to all your customers? Uh, okay, so the first question, uh, why deploy v6? So, you know, probably everyone's aware. Uh, we're Aaron's out of v4 address space. Um, doesn't mean all ISPs are out, but v6 will solve that problem in that you, you'll be able to get as much address space as you need for your customers for the foreseeable future. Uh, one of the other reasons to deploy v6, your customers are asking for it. And, uh, we certainly had a number of customers that were really keen on getting v6 access through TELUS. Uh, you, today, uh, a lot of our customer traffic may be natted with uh, home gateways and such, and uh, by deploying v6, you can provide an end-to-end -end path. Um, we also have customers that do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer applications, and you know, again, v6 will provide a clear end-to-end -end path that doesn't have to go through NAT and deal with any of those potential problems. Uh, the last reason is that, uh, you know, if people don't, or ISPs don't make progress on deploying v6, then maybe eventually there'll be some government regulation. So if we deploy it ahead of the government getting, having to get involved, and in Canada we have the CRTC, then it demonstrates that self-governance or governance is actually working properly. Uh, okay, so who needs to be involved in your v6 deployment plan? Um, we involved, you know, the best and the brightest from different areas of our business to make sure we were successful. Uh, we had uh, a large number of people from our network engineering, uh, network operations team, uh, security, and, you know, very important to have your people from our systems and application primes that uh, support our customers and uh, deploy uh, services to our customers. Uh, the other thing we did is make uh, IPv6 a top corporate priority uh, in order to secure uh, resources to, to make it successful. And also uh, focus on uh, long-term uh, service alignment around IPv6 rather than just uh, a small, quick and dirty project uh, to get it done for one area of the network. Um, also be inclusive. IPv6 is not a one-time effort. You're going to have to Every project that comes up, a new service, you're going to have to consider it, uh, and it, it'll be a new way of doing business. Uh, what? Uh, consider the continuum of IPv4 through IPv6, and we tried to aim for an end state of IPv6 only. 
just because uh, V6 is not a, a solution today for V4 exhaust. Uh, what is, uh, consider what is practical uh, by service. Um, you know, what may be very practical for our home internet customers may not always be practical for our wireless services. Uh, TELUS uh, offers the following services and these are kind of what we decided to target for uh, IPv6. So on the consumer wireless side, um, we are going to uh, target IPv6 only on the handsets and there are a number of uh, US uh, wireless providers, I think AT&T and Verizon that have already gone down this route. Um, on the consumer home internet, um, we're gonna go dual stack and where we run out of uh, V4 address space in the future, we may have to deploy NAT44 for some services. We don't, really don't want to, but um, just because of the number of peer-to-peer uh, -peer applications that consumer customers use, uh, going V6 only wasn't um, exactly practical at this point. And then uh, for our business internet customers, we're gonna target uh, dual stack. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Uh, when and where? So uh, immediately uh, three years ago, uh, we targeted uh, our peering and transit connections and we modified our procedures so that whenever we turn up a new peer uh, or we add or modify our transit providers, uh, we made sure that we enabled dual stack IPv6 connectivity. Um, we also uh, targeted early our client facing uh, DNS servers to make sure that they were dual stacked. Uh, and in our case, because we already had uh, a V4 uh, MPLS network, uh, we decided to deploy V6 across our, our core using 6PE. Um, it made the most sense for us, uh, and we haven't had uh, any major issues with it. Uh, we also focused our development on newer networks where the support for V6 was already available. We just had to deploy it. Uh, start. Uh, we also focused on areas or network where, uh, particularly our consumer services, where V4 exhaust was most imminent. Uh, start with, uh, we also focused on high growth services and where we have to consider um, deploying NAT or we've already, uh, a lot of customers have deployed NAT on their home routers and such. Uh, and just, you know, learn from our deployments and trying to adapt uh, more broadly in the future. <clears throat> so, uh, where and when? Uh, in 2012, we modified uh, our peering and transit behavior, and the following graph here shows uh, over the last couple of years the percentage of uh, new peers that we're able to turn up with uh, dual stack connectivity. It's not as high as we'd like it to be, but um, we've been able to uh, enable all of our transit providers with dual stack connectivity and uh, our larger peers and CDN connections have all been V6 enabled. Uh, how? Um, take opportunities to get experience with V6 wherever you can. Um, so for TELUS, we've uh, provided uh, internet connectivity to a number of uh, uh, conferences uh, in Vancouver and other places. Uh, so we started uh, in Vancouver in 2012 where we, we sponsored network connectivity for the Aaron conference, the NANOG conference, IETF, and then we gave uh, several more. Uh, we actually, you know, from that we, we found one issue uh, with our 6PE configuration, one of our routers, based upon the NANOG meeting we were able to quickly get fixed. So, you know, having some example traffic and experience with uh, Deploying V6 and making sure everything is running properly is um, very valuable. Um, we had to, you know, develop some robust provisioning processes and support capabilities, uh, develop methods for uh, rapid enablement, uh, and build V6 into the scope of uh, future projects of services we were considering uh, going forward. Uh, so this is just a, a graph uh, from 2012 of the uh, I, overall traffic um, that we saw at the ITF meeting, uh, ITF 88 in Vancouver. Uh, this here is a graph of the V6 only traffic, so it was about 30%, or sorry, 10% of it. 
it was surprisingly low, but uh, it seems like the ITF crowd doesn't like to watch much Netflix or YouTube streaming. So, uh, key learnings that tell us: um, IPv6 just works at this point for most of our users. We have had very few reports of any troubles. Uh, the network. We also found that the network is the easy part. It's layer eight and above, mainly your systems that. Uh, or really took all the preparation time and work. Uh, in particular, policy management, uh, customer records, and security are, are far more challenging. We also, it takes some uh, time for people and processes to catch up. Uh, managing dependencies and in interlock uh, with other infrastructure projects that you may be going on at the same time. Uh, we also uh, invested heavily in communication and training. Uh, and we created some, our, some instructor-led courses for the core IPv6 team members. Uh, we also uh, purchased an e-learning course for the broader team members at TELUS. And we also created some company-wide uh, communication so they were aware of our progress with the IPv6 rollout. Uh, take time to develop a, a strong uh, IP management plan with uh, route summarization uh, geolocations for different parts of your network and keep uh, security in mind as well. Uh, we also found that the uh, RIPE Atlas and NLNOG tools were very useful for verifying that uh, you have IPv6 connectivity to other providers as well as uh, troubleshooting issues that we had. Uh, particularly, I found NLNOG very useful for that because you can have a ping test done all at once from all the NLNOG nodes back to your IPv6 host to verify that you have no connectivity issues. Uh, other key learnings around education. Uh, our operational staff need to be ready for IPv6. Uh, we have uh, deployed uh, the e-learning uh, course from a NEFO 6. The graph below shows uh, the TELUS team members uh, within the first five weeks of, of launch, the, the number of registrations, the accesses and completions for that course. Challenges that we encountered. Uh, on our home gateways, they had to be updated, um, a software upgrade in all of our home gateways that we provide to customers to enable IPv6 support well ahead of time. To avoid a flood of uh, DHCP version 6 requests and subsequent radius, uh, we needed to sequence the enablement on our network as part of our rollout plan. So we first enable IPv6 in our policy management system. We have to go to all of our access devices that those customers are connected to and enable the DHCP option 18. Uh, and then finally, we go and enable the uh, DHCP version 6 scopes on our aggregation routers. And in this way, we were able to prevent a, a large number of failed DHCP version 6 requests that resulted in uh, radius requests to our authentication systems. Uh, eventually, we'll have to uh, target some CGN and NAT 4.4 rollout to are less sophisticated services where people may be only uh, focus on web browsing and you know other simple services. Uh, we did find, we've done a trial with CGN and NAT44 and we did find out that uh, it broke as expected some port seeking applications like desktop sharing where they're trying to make a connection back in uh, to their devices. Uh, uh, the challenges we had on the wireless side um, the different, you know, device OSs have different strategies. Android devices clearly support XLAT. Um, uh, Apple's strategy with V6 is that for V6 only is with iOS 9, they're going to recertify all the apps so that they'll work on a V6 only network. Uh, we also found an issue uh, with uh, some LTE, uh, LTE chipsets in uh, a lot of phones where if the customer is close to the U.S. border and they start to roam on a U.S. network versus our Canadian one, 
that they'll lose network connectivity for several minutes. So we're working with a chipset vendor to try and fix that before we can do uh, a more extensive IPv6 rollout uh, for Canadian wireless customers. And it, we also had a few issues on a certain AND sets with uh, MTU sizes where ironically the PMTU packets were too big and they were getting dropped by the phones. Uh, so PMTU wasn't working at all on IPv6. So we had to make some changes to the TCIP stacks on the phones and their configuration to avoid that. <clears throat> uh, okay, so our IPv6 addressing plan. Uh, we'd recommend, you know, doing your V6 allocations on the nibble boundary, so by increments of uh, slash uh, four uh, to exploit the hex notation, just makes things easier. Uh, we also used uh, regional blocks for summarization of, uh, of routes for geolocation, so in a lot of cases we broke it down in Canada by province, and then in some cases uh, by major centers we allocated uh, different IPv6 blocks for those um, to help us with aggregation in the future. Uh, we also found that you know with v6 uh, little address space goes a long way. So uh, a single slash 64 uh, can be used for all of your regional point-to-point -point links. Um, I know some service providers prefer to use a slash 64 for every point-to-point, -point, but um, we didn't have an issue. We either we interface with other service providers. We used a, a slash 127 or 126. If you want to go with a slash 64, that's fine. We haven't had any issues with uh, the slash 127 approach. Uh, you can also allocate, and we did, uh, a slash 64 for all of our router loopbacks addresses uh, so that they're all in one contained uh, address range. And we also dedicated a slash 48 to all of our uh, backbone infrastructure to keep it in a separate address space from uh, any of our customer address space. And so you can implement infrastructure ACLs to filter out any of that traffic at your edge of your network. Uh, service addressing. Um, so what we've gone with is for business internet customers, we will sign a slash 48 to each of those customers statically. Uh, for consumer customers, uh, we will uh, allocate a slash 56 via DHCP uh, prefix delegation. And then each of our consumer customers uh, on the wireless side will get, uh, each handset will get its own slash 64. Uh, don't take a chance with the ULA address space. I, hopefully no one will. Uh, and just enjoy the abundance of uh, IPv6 address space that you have available. Uh, a few big picture realities that we considered. Uh, not all service providers will exhaust their existing v4 address space in the next three years. So that may be a consideration for you. Uh, IPv6 will offer the most uh, reliable end-to-end -end path between endpoints uh, as NAT, 6, or NAT uh, 444 or carrier grade NAT uh, has to be deployed uh, by those ISPs that are exhausting. Everybody uh, has a good reason, uh, content providers, ISPs, to adopt v6 on, for the benefit of their users. Uh, we expect that IPv6 traffic will surpass 50% of the global internet in the next three years. Uh, we'll see if we're right or not. It takes time for ISPs to go from the inception of the program to actually deploying. It took us uh, approximately three years to get from the point of starting our plans, getting all the systems complete, and actually being able to roll it out to our customers. So the sooner you get going, the better. Uh, now we get to uh, sit back and, and watch our, uh, it scale. Uh, we've completed the V6 enablement of our uh, consumer internet customers in Quebec. Uh, we're currently working through our Alberta customers, and then we'll move on to BC. We are hoping that uh, by the end of the year, we'll uh, finish our consumer internet uh, rollout in Canada. Uh, this is a graph. Uh, we started our you know large-scale rollout in June, um, and TELUS has gone from below 1% uh, IPv6 enabled to, I think the latest graphs I looked at here were around 8% uh, of our users can now get uh, IPv6. 
Uh, we also have a, a graph here of, from the Cisco labs um, that pulls the Google data and then uh, allows you to uh, graph it over a selectable period of time. And the Canada, Canadian IPv6 enablement has gone from half a percent in June to now looking at the graph, it's, it's over 2%. So we are hoping as we finish our rollout that uh, the Canadian IPv6 usage will increase to uh, 5% or a little bit higher than that. Uh, and that's uh, all I had. Are there any questions? Uh, middle first. You're the first to arrive. Oh, hey there. Uh, my name is Bobby Flame. I'm with the United States government. I'm one of the co-chairs of the IPv6 task force. And in trying to get our own U.S. government rolled out to be uh, IPv6 100%, some of the problems we had were with uh, vendors and uh, providers uh, and even some cloud uh, server pro uh, service providers. Um, how did you deal with that challenge? Because uh, I know that sometimes when you get a certain people, they're not as um, uh, enabling or as positive as, you know, you are in so far as getting to IPv6. So I was just wondering uh, how you may have dealt with some of those challenges. So, sorry, so the question was around uh, how we dealt with vendors and... Yes. So in other words, when you had to go to vendors or other, uh, when you needed other services, how did you deal with that? Because when we have gone to procure a certain uh, things or, or services, uh, equipment, we run into some people who have like, no, well, it's, it's capable but not enabled, it's been tested, not tested, so how did you, how did you, if, number one, did you have any challenges, and number two, how did you deal with them? Does sure. that make sense? We definitely did have some challenges. Um, one of our vendors, um, I, we use a lot of equipment from both Alcatel, Lucent, as well as Juniper. Uh, Juniper had always good support for IPv6. We didn't really have any challenges there. Alcatel uh, Lucent has very good support for v6 as well. However, the policy management system that uh, we were using from Alcatel Lucent at the time didn't have any support for IPv6. So as part of our planning, we kind of focused on newer areas of our network uh, where we already knew the equipment supported v6. Uh, the policy management issue was somewhat of a surprise and it took us a long time. We had to basically go and upgrade that entire policy management system so it had support for V6 and then we could start our rollout. Um, I think the network piece generally from our experience has been pretty easy because most of the vendors, uh, especially the newer equipment, has good support for V6. It's more on the system side that can take uh, uh, a lot of work. Uh, it's also... You know, I think I've found more in the data center side, it's been a challenge in some cases because people have older firewall or security products that aren't as easy to upgrade. But it seems like a lot of the network vendors have taken V6 very seriously and their support is, is well tested. Okay, uh, let's go to that side, number one. Hi, uh, Rob Seastrom. I work for Time Warner Cable, and I have a learn from our fail tale. But first, I want to see a show of hands. Who here has uh, deployed a single stack IPv6 thing, product, environment at a reasonable scale? Any hands? I'm not surprised. Did you find broken stuff in your network? We found broken stuff all over our network that had been there for a couple of years. And the reason is that it's easy to screw up something when you're not used to looking at it. And for a lot of the folks who are deploying or initially putting IPv6 configs out there, uh, you get it wrong, you know, it's, it's your first try. Why didn't the phone ring? Real easy, happy eyeballs. It was hiding it from us. So we went to roll out something that didn't have a plan B built in and all of a sudden, people are calling and saying, well, it's, it's failing one time in N. What, what's with this? I can mo it, V6 mostly works, but every so often something's just like the, the sin goes out and the act doesn't come back. And we found things like ECMP, which was mostly working, 
And, you know, as long as you got lucky and the five tuple hashed onto the right thing and ping hashed onto the right bundle, ping hashed onto a working bundle, but, you know, every so often you get a, a TCP session that didn't. So uh, ping isn't enough. Test your stuff. Strobe across multiple sets of ports, multiple sets of protocols. Do some live traffic testing as part of your rollout. Your, uh, your applications people will thank you later. Thanks. Yeah, I, I would agree. I mean, we did a, a lot of uh, lab testing by our tech strategy team to make sure it worked. And we also uh, did a, a friendly trial with a lot of uh, TELUS employees to make sure that uh, the V6 services worked properly on the network before we started a, a large scale rollout. Oh, yeah, to be clear, this was the friendly trial where we found it. It would have been a lot worse if it wasn't. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I think the back. Hi, Philip Matthews, uh, Alcatel Lucent. A little bit strange here. I hope you guys can hear me better than I can. Um, I'm wondering about your IPv6 only wireless deployment. How are you handling older devices? Could you hear it? Uh, yeah. yeah, how are we handling IPv6 only for wireless? So, uh, yeah, older devices would uh, be V4 only. Um, it's newer devices that we've uh, certified to, to work with V6 only. There's you know extensive testing that's done with every handset um, before the configuration and the new firmware is pushed, before those devices are, are turned V6 only. So we know uh, well ahead of time that all the features on that phone will work. Uh, older devices that aren't getting firmware updates anymore, uh, they're going to have to stay V4. But you know, uh, devices that support uh, IPv6 only. Uh, we'll, we have, you know, uh, NAT64 gateways deployed with uh, DNS64 for if those phones need to get v4 only sites, then they'll go through the NAT64 gateways. But uh, a lot of content now from, you know, Google, Netflix, uh, Facebook, other companies is, you know, already dual stacked. And a lot of the traffic will be v6 only uh, from the start. So they're going to get separate contexts? Is that the idea, the old and new? Yeah, we have separate PDT, uh, PDP uh, contexts or APNs uh, for the V6 only. Um, I mean, one of our options is we could have gone dual stack, but it kind of defeats the, the purpose. We'd really like to get to the end state of V6 only. So that's been kind of our goal. Thank you. OK, question uh, mic three. Yes, hi, Andrei Hemeko with Athena Health. Maybe trivial question for uh, service providers, not so trivial for not so much service providers. How did you go about automating the provisioning of the address space, slicing, dicing? I can't imagine you did that by hand. How, how did you automate the provisioning, the slicing of the address space? Was it all by hand? Uh, well, I mean, we have a system for, that supports both our V4 and, and V6 address space. Um, but we did, um, you know, it's an inventory system that supports both um, V4 and V6, and we kind of split it up by regions based upon our, our customer base. Uh, we expected the IPv6 usage to grow, and then uh, for each of our aggregation routers, uh, we allocated uh, a certain amount of address space based upon how many customers we expected to be on each of those routers. I, I think that's what your question was. Also, I guess, basically about reprovisioning, which I imagine you did all the links on your network. I don't know the, what was the scale of that rollout. Did you keep the core IPv4 and just roll IPv6 into VPNs only? Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned in the presentation we use 6PE. So uh, TELUS is the MPLS core, uh, and we, we tunnel the V6 traffic. So we, we didn't need to do V6 addressing on all of our... Uh, existing core. Uh, we only have the V6 uh, on the edge of our network. Thanks. Okay, I think uh, mic number one. Hi, Doug Montgomery Nest. You mentioned having a path MTU discovery problem. Can you say a bit more about what it was and what you did to fix it? Or was it strictly to limit the packets to 1280? Uh, so I wasn't personally involved with that, but my understanding is uh, the TCIP stack on some of the phones was trying to send path MTU messages as part of the regular V6, uh, but the phone was dropping packets over uh, 1,400 bytes. 
And so the PMTU messages weren't even making it out. So they had to reconfigure the TCIP stack on, on the phone so it used a lower MTU so that the path MTU messages were actually smaller than, they didn't try to send these very large uh, PMTU that weren't supported across the wireless network. And mic number three. Uh, Phil Rosenthal from IS Prime. So first of all, I think it's, it's a very good milestone where we are, where we're now having many different eyeball networks talking you know, at each successive nanog about deploying V6 all the way to their customers. Um, there was recently a discussion on the nanog mailing list, which is probably still going on now, about how do you accelerate um, the actual usage of it for the end users. And it seems the main problems uh, going forward are basically, A, people are using really old gateways and aren't going to upgrade them until it stops working, which may be years from now. And B, many users are still running Windows XP, which can do V6, but you need to type in some commands that most people don't know to do. Uh, so have you considered the education impacts of like how do you push your customers to actually enable their networks now that you can hand it off to them? Well, I think TELUS was in uh, a unique position because we, as part of our, our service offering, we have a routed gateway that we give, a CPE equipment that we give to customers that you know, routes across either you know, Ethernet uh, or DSL connection. And it also provides wireless in the customer's home. And we were able to get the, the V6 support added to that CPE equipment. Um, if the customer's equipment can support uh, DCP version 6 uh, prefix delegation, then they can use their own equipment as well. Um, we allow customers to get up to um, uh, five DCP v6 uh, requests at their home uh, if they require it. But it is a big challenge. Um, we do have a certain percentage of our customer base that's using their own uh, CPE or equipment. And if that equipment doesn't support, they don't want to use our equipment, uh, that we give them and their equipment doesn't support it, it is a big challenge and I, we don't necessarily have a solution for that either. Uh, the, the second part was also Windows XP though. Like there is just an education thing of they need to run a command, it'll enable it, it doesn't happen by default. So. Uh, Windows XP, uh, the Windows XP doesn't do it by default. You, have, you know, users have to enable oh. it. You're right. Uh, I, yeah, that's a, a good, where we've seen it, it, it happens for any device that supports Slack, it happens automatically, but you're right. We haven't gone out to our customers that have XP and asked them to enable it. Um, I, I would hope that those customers would upgrade to something more modern than trying to get them to enable IPv6 on XP. I, I, there may be other defects that they encounter. I think they would be better off if they upgraded to something more modern. Okay. Thank you. Thanks very much.